Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of being here. Your family gathered together to sing praises to your name, to speak to you in prayer, and to hear your voice speaking to us in the various sermons and seminars. We ask, Lord, that as we open your word this evening, that your Holy Spirit will be present with us as the Holy Spirit has been already. Give us clear minds, open hearts, and empower us, Lord, to speak your truth with boldness. This we pray in the awesome number of, name of Jesus. Amen. As we look out at the world with bloodshot eyes, everything seems to be in disarray. War, the disintegration of the nuclear family, unprecedented economic stress, global pandemics, floods, droughts, famine, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, political strife, riots, mass shootings, armed robberies, mass migration, drug addiction, suicides. I could continue the list, but I think that we all agree that these things are the order of the day. Everything seems to be spinning out of control. The demons appear to be at the wheel. But the question is, are they really? What on earth is happening? The Bible provides the unequivocal answer to that question. After Jesus won the decisive battle on the cross of Calvary and Satan was legally cast out, as the representative and ruler of this world, he was filled with vitriolic hatred, the desperate rage of a mortally wounded warrior. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12 describes his wrath after he was cast out of heaven at the cross. Let's read that verse. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But now notice, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. In context, this verse does not refer primarily to the original casting out of Satan at the beginning. In context, it is referring to the casting out of Satan when Jesus died on the cross. Go with me to John chapter 12 and verses 31 to 33 where we find the reference to the casting out of Satan at the cross. It says there in John 12 verse 31, now Jesus is speaking just a few days before his death, now is the judgment of this world. Now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So he was cast out as the ruler and representative of this world when Jesus won the key battle on the cross. After the cross, the inhabitants of heaven could rejoice. You notice that Revelation 12, verse 12 says, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But then comes the woe. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because Satan has descended to you with unmitigated wrath, because he knows his time is short. Like a wounded lion, Satan now goes about the world to wreak havoc havoc on the earth. Ellen White expressed it this way, Satan, Satan's angels went forth like roaring lions seeking to destroy the followers of Jesus. As we approach the final crisis, 
when the sentinel angels release the winds of chaos upon this world, Satan will make one last desperate effort to regain the kingdom that he lost at the cross. Ellen White described it this way in the book Education, pages 179 and 180. Angels are now restraining the winds of strife that they may not blow until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth, and when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. So what we see today is, as Jesus said, the beginning of sorrows. The worst is still to come. What we see today is the last gasp of a defeated foe. Similar to Saddam Hussein when he saw that he had lost the Gulf War, he lit all of the oil wells. He said, I'm going, but I'm not going without a bang. Now with the passing of time, I have become keenly aware about the importance of learning the lessons of history. What is the reason why we need to study history? Because what happened in the past will occur once more in the future. And the reason is that God never changes, Satan never changes his methods, and unregenerate human beings do not change either. So by studying history, we can know what is going to happen in prophecy. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. Here, the wise man, King Solomon, wrote, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. In chapter three and verse 15 of the same book, I'm reading out from the NIV, what happens now has happened in the past, and what will happen in the future has happened before. God makes the same things happen again and again. However, the history that we see before our physical eyes is only a shadow of the invisible movements that are transpiring behind the veil. Secular historians can only describe the shadow, what I call horizontal history, the history that is here before our eyes. They can only describe discernible events that took place with certain persons at a certain time, in a certain way, and in a certain place. However, there is a history that is transpiring in the invisible realm that cannot be seen except by enlightened vision. It is a war for world dominion between Christ and Satan, heaven and earth, transpiring behind the veil, what I call vertical history. There are the real movements behind the scenes that we only see shadows of. The Apostle Paul described the stealth forces invisible to unenlightened eyes that work beyond the realm of flesh and blood. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13, the Apostle Paul wrote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that is, human beings, on a horizontal level, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 
Our war is not only horizontal on a level that we see, it is vertical between heaven and earth, between Christ and Satan. Ellen White quoted this text that I just read, and she used it to describe what occurred in the days of Esther. I want to read that statement. It's found in Manuscript 51, 1899. She wrote this, History repeats itself. The same masterful mind, that's Satan, that plotted against the faithful in ages past is now at work to gain control of the fallen churches. And through them, he may condemn and put to death all who will not worship the idle Sabbath. We have not a battle with mortals, as it may appear. Appear to what? To our visible eyes, yes. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. There is a secret conspiracy behind the events that human eyes see. The question is, what is a conspiracy? Well, the word conspiracy, at least in my mind, conjures up the image of Judas Iscariot, who overtly seemed to support Christ, but in the shadows was stealthily colluding with the religious leaders to betray him. The conspiracy to betray Jesus was not a mere human idea. Those who lived at that time with unenlightened eyes, they might have thought, well, Judas was kind of a nasty character. But it was not a mere human idea to deliver Jesus. Satan was orchestrating the event behind the scenes. Scripture removes the veil and helps us see who was behind the plot. Only the Bible can show us that. Notice John 13, verse 27. This is at the Last Supper. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Who entered him? Judas. Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Even the disciples were unenlightened. They thought that Jesus was sending Judas on a mission. Notice chapter 13 and verses 28 and 29. John 13, 28 and 29. It tells us the reaction of the disciples when Jesus said, what you're going to do, do quickly. It says there, but no one knew at the table for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. They were unenlightened about what was happening behind the curtain, behind the veil. What was happening behind visible history, that there was an enemy, invisible to human eyes, who was orchestrating the events. John 6, verse 70 and 71, tell us that Jesus called Judas a devil. Notice what it says there in John 6, verse 70. Did I not choose you, Jesus says to the disciples, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. And at the Last Supper, we find, actually before the Last Supper, we find these words in John 13 and verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. The Bible removes the veil and helps us see the history transpiring behind history. Now the big question is this, 
How can we fight an invisible foe? It seems well nigh impossible. However, the good news is that God has removed the veil between vertical and horizontal history, the shadow and the substance, so that believers that cannot see with their physical eyes what's really going on, with enlightened eyes, they can understand what is transpiring. And that which removes the veil is the Bible. However, God has further removed the veil when he gave Ellen White a view of invisible history. Her most important book on final events is The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan, where she exposes what happens behind the curtain. She exposes Satan's stealth objectives behind the curtain. It is no wonder that Satan attempted to kill her just before she wrote the book, The Great Controversy, because he knew that she was going to take away the veil so that we could see the history transpiring behind history. Ellen White wrote about the relationship between the events of visible shadow history and the events in the invisible realm. A superficial glance at history seems to indicate that the events that take place take place because of the will and prowess of man. However, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy remove the veil and reveal that God is the true guide of history. In the book Education, page 173, Ellen White wrote these words. In the annals of human history, the annals are the records of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear to what? To what we can see. Appear to depend on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by man's power, ambition, or caprice. But in the Word of God, the curtain is drawn aside and we behold behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. The Bible helps us see behind, above, and beyond the play and counterplay of the events of human history. You know, Ellen White's reference to play and counterplay awakens the idea of a game. Because in a game, one plays and the other counterplays. We can compare the development of historical events with a game of chess, where the movement of the pieces represents the movements in human history. Now, chess has two players. And, of course, the purpose of each player is to counteract the moves of the other with the ultimate purpose of putting the other player at checkmate. The strategic chess game, so to speak, between Christ and Satan is not a mere game. It is, so to speak, for all the marvels. The good news is that the play and counterplay of historical events, God has a distinct advantage over Satan because before the game begins, God already knows how it's going to end. He already knows all of the moves that the enemy is going to make. How would you like to play a game of chess if you already knew all the moves that the other player was going to make? 
there, was no, there would be no opportunity of losing. So Satan is working at a disadvantage. God knows how Satan is going to play. Satan has to guess how God is going to play. And when you guess, you make mistakes. Notice Isaiah chapter 46 and verses 9 through 11. Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 11. Here we find a description of the one thing that distinguishes the true God from all false pretenders. It says there, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Why? Here comes the explanation. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, God says, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. That's comforting. History is under the control of God, even though to our naked eyes, it appears that the enemy is in control. Now, on a certain occasion, there was a meeting between Ahab, the king of Israel, he was a bad king, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, he was a good king. So they had a family, kind of like a family reunion in Samaria, and Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, you know, now that we're together, why don't we join our armies and go and fight against our common enemy, the Syrians. And Jehoshaphat, being a good king, said to Ahab, well, um, shouldn't we consult the Lord to see if it's the Lord's will? Don't you have a prophet around? And Ahab says, prophets galore. I've got 400 of them. Now, Ahab summoned his prophets. And he asked them if it was God's will for him and Jehoshaphat to go to war against the Syrians. What do you suppose the false prophets told him? Oh yes, and God will give you a signal victory. But Jehoshaphat being a good king was not very much persuaded by the tone of the prophets. And so he says to Ahab, now by chance don't you have a prophet of the Lord around? And Ahab said, yes, he's in the dungeon. Because every time that he prophesies, he prophesies evil. And Jehoshaphat says, that's the Lord's prophet's prophet, because that's where the Lord's prophets live, in the dungeon. So, Micaiah is summoned to the presence of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And Ahab asks him the same question. Should Jehoshaphat and I and our armies go to war against the Syrians? Now, I'm going to go to the end of the story, and we're coming back to where we left off here. Ahab went to battle, and he was killed. Notice what we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 33 and 34. 2 Chronicles 18, 33 and 34. It speaks about Ahab in battle. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot, facing the Syrians until evening. And about the time of sunset, he died. His prophets had told him, you're going to gain a great victory. But he was killed in battle. Now let's go to where we left off in the story. Why was Ahab killed in the battlefield? To the unenlightened observer, the death of Ahab was simply a casualty of war. 
However, according to Micaiah, Ahab's death had already been determined in a heavenly council before he was killed. Go with me now to 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 18 to 22. 2 Chronicles 18, verses 18 through 22. Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. Now he seems to digress from the occasion. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. In other words, he had a vision. And all the host of heaven standing at his right hand and at his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So who of this heavenly host is willing to go tell Ahab to go to battle so that he gets killed? <laughs> so one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Nobody wanted to do it. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. Who was behind the prophets, the false prophets? This spirit in the heavenly council, who was this spirit? It wasn't a good angel. Good angels don't lie. This being says, I'll be a lying spirit. By the way, could Satan go to heaven before the cross? To the heavenly councils? Just read the book of Job. So he was up there. He went for this meeting up there. The death of Ahab was determined before he died in a heavenly council. You would only know this because we have the Bible that reveals the history beyond history. And so it says, And the Lord said, You shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. And then God says, Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets because the Bible attributes to God what he allows. God did not put the lying spirit. He just allowed Satan to put the lying spirit in the, um, in the mouth of the false prophets. You see, the Bible removes the veil and helps us discern what is going on behind, above, and beyond visible history. The visible events of history are only a small sliver of the real battle that transpires behind the scenes. We can compare the play and counterplay of historical events to a seemingly harmless iceberg that floats leisurely and peacefully in the North Atlantic. The Titanic tragedy demonstrated that the visible part of an iceberg was mere a, a small fraction of the danger lurking below. The unseen part of the iceberg was the most dangerous. Likewise, the greatest dangers in history are hidden from human sight and can only be understood by the testimony of the Bible. The book of Esther illustrates in living color the conspiracy behind history. Esther is the only book of the Bible that does not mention the name of God. That's one of the reasons why it was one of the last books to be included in the Old Testament canon. However, Although the name of God does not overtly appear in the book on the surface, you know by the story that the text screams that an invisible hand was guiding events to deliver Israel from genocide. The story does not mention Satan by name either. Doesn't mention God by name. Doesn't mention Satan by name. But the play and counterplay of events clearly reveals Two antagonistic powers, invisible to human eyes, that were orchestrating the events of shadow history or history on a horizontal plane. Ellen White, by inspiration, removed the veil, and she wrote the following, Five Testimonies 450. Satan instigated 
the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. But his plots were defeated by a counter power that reigns among the children of men. Did God know long before the history of this world what was going to happen in the days of Esther? Of course he did. So could he maneuver to counteract Satan's actions? Of course he could. See, Satan is working at a great disadvantage because he has to guess what God is going to do. I thank God for the spirit of prophecy, which removes the veil and allows us to see the history that has been written behind history, the history of the great controversy. The book of Job also illustrates the play and counterplay of history. The story tells us that heaven was keenly aware of what was happening on horizontal history and vertical history, if you read chapters 1 and chapter 2. But all of those who were on the horizontal level, on the earthly level, did not know what was going on until God revealed Leviathan at the end of the story, and then everybody knew that there was an invisible battle, an invisible enemy that had caused all of Job's problems. If a mere secular historian had written about the many calamities that befell Job, he could only have described the events that were occurring in horizontal history and probably would have attributed Job's problems to bad luck. However, the Bible removes the veil and helps us see the real battle between Christ and Satan. Now let's notice another example in this invisible struggle between Christ and Satan. We're going to discuss for a moment the birth of Christ. Matthew wrote that when Jesus was born, Herod took measures to kill him. Let's read it in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. Of course, the reason why Herod wanted to kill him is because he considered him a rival to his throne. Notice Matthew 2 verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which had determined from the wise men. Now, any secular historian could have written what Matthew wrote. The account tells us where this occurred, in the vicinity of Bethlehem. It tells us when it occurred, during the reign of Herod. It tells us with whom it occurred, with Herod and with the child. And it tells us why it occurred, because Herod feared losing his throne. But the Bible removes the veil and shows who really wanted the death of Jesus. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. Folks, we need to read history with enlightened eyes. With the eyes enlightened by the Bible and enlightened by the spirit of prophecy. Notice Revelation chapter 12 verse 4. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Herod, Satan says to Herod, you know, there's uh, an individual who has been born who is a menace to your throne, but really Satan is saying he's a menace to my throne. He's working behind the veil, behind the sea. He's working in ver vertical history. He's working not in shadow history, but in concrete history, that which is moving history. By the way, the dragon that attempted to cure, kill Christ was Satan, the dragon, working through the civil power of Rome, which is also described as a dragon, we're going to see. The dragon's dragon, if you please. Now, historians tell us that the Roman emperors mercilessly persecuted and imprisoned Christians. This is after Christ died and ascended to heaven. However, the Bible removes the veil 
and tells us that the devil was behind the persecution of the early church. Let's take, for example, the church of Smyrna. It's the second church of the book of Revelation. It's the persecuted church. There's lots of death language involved. Christians are being martyred. They're being killed. And they're being imprisoned. Now, who's doing this? Well, it's the Roman emperors. But notice how the Bible describes it. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Here Jesus says to the church of Smyrna, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Who? I thought it was the Roman emperors. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Clearly, the devil did not personally cast any of the members of the church of Smyrna into prison. He did it by influencing the Roman emperors to do it from behind the veil. Ellen White explained that the dragon primarily represents Satan, but in a secondary sense, the dragon symbolizes the Roman emperors whom Satan used to imprison Christians. Notice Great Controversy, page 438. Great Controversy, page 438. The dragon is said to be Satan. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. So I want you to notice that the civil power is the dragon whose actions are orchestrated by the dragon behind the scenes. Are you with me so far? Now, not only did Satan use Herod working from behind the scenes, not only did Satan use the civil powers of Rome to persecute early Christians, but Satan also, during the 1260 years, recruited visible enemies that he could work through. Notice Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter, um, let's see, Revelation chapter 13 and verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 13 verses 2 and 3 tells us that when the Roman Empire fe fell, it gave its authority and its throne to another power. It's transferring its power to another nation. Actually, an extension of the same nation. Notice Revelation 13, verse 2 and 3. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. This, by the way, is the beast that rises from the sea, a symbol of the papacy. And now notice what the dragon does. The dragon is a Roman Empire, influenced by whom? Influenced by Satan. It says the dragon gave him, the dragon gives the beast his what? His power, his throne, and what else? Great authority. And then what does the beast do? Is the beast under the control of the dragon? Yes, he's the visible manifestation of the invisible dragon. Notice Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 and verse 25. Daniel 7, 21 and 25. Speaking about the little horn, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Who persecuted the saints of the Most High? Who did? No, it doesn't say Satan there. It says what? The little horn. Is the little horn a visible power? The papacy. Is it visible? 
Absolutely. Let's notice. It says, then the saints shall be given into his hand. How long? For a time and times and half a time. I was watching, this is verse 25, 21, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So who was warring against the saints? The little horn, a visible earthly power that received its authority from Rome, the dragon, but who is behind that dragon? Satan. Let's go to Revelation 13 where it refers to the same power as the little horn as the beast. The same power, only it's called the beast in Revelation 13. Let's read verse 5, and then let's read verse 7. Speaking about the beast, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for how long? For 42 months. Is that the same as time, times, and the dividing of time? I know that all you Michiganders know the prophecies forwards and backwards because you still study prophecy and you still study the cardinal doctrines of the Adventist church. Praise the Lord for that. So notice, the same time period the beast does, persecutes the saints as the little horn. That's what we find in verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with whom? With the saints and to over them. But now I want you to notice something very interesting. Up till now we've seen that during the 1260 years the little horn persecuted the saints of the Most High. The beast which is the same power persecuted the saints of the Most High. But when we go to Revelation 12 it says something different. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and we're going to read verse 6 and then we're going to read verse 14. Verse 6 and verse 14. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So who is persecuting the woman that gave birth to the male child? Oh, the dragon. For how long? Let's go down to verse 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished. Is it the same as the little horn? Nourished for how long? For time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And the, ser the ancient serpent is the dragon, the devil and Satan. So who was behind the persecutions of the little horn and the beast? The dragon. Are you following me or not? Satan was behind it. Now let's talk about the attack against the final remnant. The attack against the final remnant. At the end of 1260 years of persecution, we know that the little horn or the beast received what? A deadly wound. However, the Bible tells us, prophecy tells us, that that wound is going to heal. And then when it does, the same dragon that persecuted for a time, times, and the dividing of time through the papacy will vent his hatred against the remnant of the woman's seed. That is the remnant of Jesus. You know, I think that sometimes we've, we've uh, misunderstood what the remnant of her seed is. The remnant of her seed is the remnant of Jesus. You say, why is that? Let me ask you, in Revelation 12, has the seed of the woman already been, been identified before this verse? Who is the seed of the woman? The child. The child that Satan wanted to kill. That's a seed. In Galatians 3, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed. Not to seeds as of many, but to his seed, which is Christ. So the earlier part of Revelation 12 identifies the seed as Christ. So the remnant of her seed is the remnant of Jesus. Are you with me? There's a remnant of Jesus. So Satan is going to vent his anger against the remnant 
of the woman's seed, the remnant of Jesus, and that is described at the very last verse of Revelation 12. It says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that is the remnant of Jesus, and what characteristics do they have? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So who's going to be enraged with the seed of the woman? With the woman's seed? Ah, the dragon is going to be enraged. So then suddenly Satan's going to become visible and he's going to fight against the remnant of her seed. Yes or no? No. He's still going to work by stealth. Now how is he going to work by stealth? By recruiting a beast that comes from the earth that will restore power to the beast that received its seat from the dragon. Notice Revelation 13 verse 11 describes this beast. See, Satan is still going to work by stealth. He's still going to work hidden behind the scenes. But it's the rage of the dragon through the earth beast. Notice Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. How is Satan going to persecute God's people at the end of time? Directly? Personally? Visibly? No. By recruiting another civil power, which we know represents the United States of America. And everything that this beast is going to do as an emissary of the dragon is to please the first beast. Let me give you a list. It speaks like a dragon. Well, let me ask you, what, what does the dragon represent? Was the previous beast governed by the dragon? Did the dragon work on the, with the other beast? The dragon is Rome. Yes, pagan Rome and papal Rome. So let me ask you, if this beast is gonna speak like a dragon, it must mean that it's speaking like Rome. Which Rome? Papal Rome. Everything that this beast does, it does to please the first beast. The Bible tells us, this is in Revelation 13, I summarized, the land beast exercises all of the authority of the first beast. It forces everyone to worship the first beast. It does everything in the presence of the first beast. I like the way the NIV uh, describes in the presence it is on behalf of the first beast and the contemporary English version translates it worked for the beast and the lexicons tell us that it means he worked at the commissioning of the first beast and then we notice that this beast from the earth will make an image to the first beast that is in honor of the first beast and he will make an image of the first beast. And it will enforce the mark of the first beast. Somehow I think that this second beast, its whole role in history is to return the power to the first one that was governed by the dragon in the invisible world. Are you following me or not? In summary, Satan tried to kill the male child working through the Roman Empire. He sought to kill the early church by the devil throwing the faithful into prison through the Roman Empire. He sought to kill the, the woman or the saints of the Most High by working through papal Rome that received its power from the dragon. And it will attempt to kill the remnant of the seed working through the United States as an emissary of a dragon because it speaks like a dragon. So far, so good? Now, go with me to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. Here we find a trilogy of evil angels that are going to persecute God's people in the end time. It says there in Revelation 16, 13, I want you to notice the three powers. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. 
coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Did we already meet the dragon in chapter 12? Yes. And out of the mouth of the beast, did we meet the beast in chapter 13? Yes. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, I say, no, the false prophet wasn't in chapter 13. False prophet is another name for the beast that rises from the earth. Okay? It's called a false prophet here. So what are the three powers that are going to persecute God's people? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But now let's go to Revelation chapter 19 and verses 19 and 20. Revelation 19 verses 19 and 20. When Jesus comes, he is going to overcome this threefold power. But there's a little difference between Revelation 19 and Revelation 16. It says there in Revelation chapter 19, verse 19 and 20, And I saw the beast, there's one of the powers in chapter 16, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, now the kings of the earth were not mentioned there in Revelation 12, the kings of the earth and their armies, that means their followers, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. That is Jesus coming with the armies of heaven. Then the beast was captured and with him what? The false prophet. So there's three powers mentioned here. One is the beast. Two is the false prophet. And three, not the dragon, but what? But the kings of the earth. Now, why the change? The change is very simple. The kings are the visible dragon, if you please. So what happens to the invisible dragon when Jesus comes? The very next verses tell us. In Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3, what happens to the dragon that is behind all of these civil powers that persecute God's people? It says in Revelation 20, verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Also now, the dragon behind all of these powers is being punished. The dragon behind the kings of the earth. And so it says in verse 3, And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished, but after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now listen to this interesting statement by Ellen White in Testimonies to Ministers, page 39. She wrote, kings, rulers, and governors. Let me ask you, what kind of leaders are those? Are those religious leaders? No, those are political leaders that are used by the religious leaders. So it says, kings and rulers and governors have placed the brand of Antichrist upon themselves and are represented as the dragon. Who is represented as the dragon? Kings and rulers and governors. We already saw that with pagan Rome. Right? Herod tried to kill the child. The emperors tried to kill the early church. The papacy, under the influence of the dragon, attempted to kill the church during the 1260 years. The dragon, Satan, influencing uh, the kings of the earth at the end of time, under the control of an apostate system, persecuting God's people. So she says, kings, rulers, and governors have placed the brand of Antichrist upon themselves and are represented as a dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So who are the ones that actually are going against God's people? Revelation 12, 17 says it's the dragon. But Ellen White identifies them as what? Kings and rulers and governors. They are the visible dragon. But when they're destroyed, then God takes measures to punish what? The invisible dragon in chapter 20. That's why he doesn't appear in chapter 19. Are you following me or not? Now, we come to the most exciting part. As we've seen, both Satan and the civil rulers are described as a dragon. 
so to speak, Satan is the dragon, uppercase, and the civil rulers are the dragon's dragon. Before the second coming, Satan works by stealth, invisibly, under the radar, through the civil powers of the world. Before the millennium, the civil rulers of the earth are oblivious and willfully ignorant that the dragon, Satan, has inspired and orchestrated their actions in the visible world from behind the veil. Having rejected the Bible, the Bible's vertical worldview, they will look at historical events only on the horizontal level. Satan will remain in this stealth mode until after the millennium. In other words, up to the second coming of Christ and during the millennium, at the second coming, all of the wicked die. All of the rulers of the world die. They didn't have the foggiest idea that all of their actions were being orchestrated from behind the veil. They were willfully ignorant because if they believed the Bible, they would have known. After the millennium, all the wicked civil rulers will resurrect. And God will remove the veil that hides visible from invisible history. And Satan will be visible to the physical eyes of all of the wicked. At that point, Satan will no longer be in stealth mode behind the veil. He will be clearly visible, orchestrating the armies of the world to go and attack the city. At that point, Satan will claim that he is the legitimate ruler of the world whose position has been usurped by someone else. You say, how could he deceive the people after the millennium? Very simple. He doesn't present himself as Satan because they wouldn't pay attention to him. Listen to this statement from Ellen White. This is Great Controversy, page 663. The wicked are Satan's captives. In rejecting Christ, they have accepted the rule of the rebel leader. They are ready to receive his suggestions and do his bidding. Yet true to his early cunning, what was his early cunning? <laughs> the Garden of Eden, camouflage. Contrary to his early, the same as his early cunning, he does not acknowledge himself to be Satan. He claims to be the prince who is the rightful owner of the world and whose inheritance has been unlawfully wrested from him. He presents himself to his deluded subjects as a redeemer, assuring them that his power has brought them forth from their graves and that he is about to rescue them from the cruelest tyranny. Now he's visible, folks. The presence of Christ having been removed, in other words, Jesus up, up to that point has not been visible. The presence of Christ having been removed, Satan works wonders to support his claims. He makes the weak strong and inspires all with his own spirit and energy. He proposes to lead them against the camp of the saints and to take possession of the city of God. With fiendish exultation, he points to the unnumbered millions who have been raised from the dead and declares that as their leader, he is well able to overthrow the city and regain his throne and his kingdom. He is no longer working by stealth. He is visible for the first time in history to all of the wicked. Now, because Satan was invisible to the kings before the millennium, they were oblivious that he was working behind the veil to influence their decisions and they act, their actions while they lived. Therefore, they will buy into Satan's lie, not knowing who he really is. At this point, Satan is the dragon leading the dragon in lowercase, the kings of the earth and of the whole world. However, when Satan leading the kings of the earth and getting them ready to attack the holy city, God will reveal in panoramic view above the holy city the real history of the world. He will reveal the history behind history. 
He will reveal everything that took place behind the veil. And the wicked for the first time will see that their actions were influenced from the invisible world, from the shadow, from the concrete history, from vertical history, if you please. And at this point, you know, many people think that Satan is going to attack the city with the wicked. They never attack the city. The wicked die attacking Satan. Because God has revealed the real history. They realize that God is right and Satan is wrong. Ellen White wrote in Great Controversy, page 671, he rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he has allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan, but they see that their case is, that their case is hopeless, that they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against Satan and those who have been his agents in deception and with the fury of demons, they turn upon them. And the biblical scenario is in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 28, verses 1 through 10. This is described there in the Bible. Now, if you allow me just a few more minutes, I would like to make an application of this to our day. Unfortunately, politicians, the media, and most Christians get their news from what they read in the newspapers and what they watch on social media and television. In other words, they get their news from horizontal history. They attribute the disintegration of society and the meltdown in nature to human factors such as climate change and the need for equity and social justice. Having cast aside the Bible, which allows them to see what is happening behind the scenes, they have a superficial view of history. They willfully forget that the two greatest climate changes in the history of the world was the flood. And it wasn't because people were using too many air conditioners. <laughs> and the second greatest was the three and a half years of uh, no rain in the days of Elijah, and that was not because they were using too many fossil fuels. Ellen White wrote the following statement in Six Testimonies, page 408. The restraining spirit of God is even now withdrawn from the, withdrawing from the world. Hurricanes, storms, tempests, fire and flood, disasters by sea and land, follow each other in quick succession. Now notice this. Science seeks to explain all these, all these so-called natural disasters. Science seeks to explain all these. The signs thickening around us, telling of the near approach of the Son of God, are attributed to any other than the true cause. Science attributes these things to what is not the true cause? She continues, men cannot discern. That's because this is happening in, in, in vertical history. Men cannot discern the sentinel angels restraining the four winds that they shall not blow until the servants of God are sealed. But when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. The political left in the United States claims that climate change is an existential threat which is due to human factors, such as fossil fuels, air conditioners, gas stoves, etc. On the other hand, many on the political right deny that there is any such thing as climate change. Both sides of the political spectrum miss the point because they are merely looking at horizontal history. To deny that there is climate change, folks, is to be willfully ignorant. And to attribute it to human factors is misguided. Having cast aside the biblical worldview, 
both sides of the political spectrum are blind to the real issue that will bring them together. Satan's desire to scapegoat those who are faithful to the Creator by observing His Holy Sabbath. We can be thankful for the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, particularly the great controversy which removes the veil and shows us what the devil's real objective is. Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8, tells us that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom will rise against kingdom. And there will be pestilences and earthquakes and famines and tumults, which is riots in our language. We're seeing that. Who's causing these things? Well, it looks like they just come as a result of climate change. But there's a power working behind the scenes that is causing these things. For what purpose? Listen carefully now. Immediately after mentioning those signs in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 and 7, Jesus says these are the beginning of sorrows. Then the very next verse, verse 9, tells us what the devil's agenda is in causing all of these things. By the way, I would recommend that, that you watch the series, download the Sum TV app, and watch the series on Matthew 24. Very important series. I consider it the most important series that I ever did in our studio. And there, I show how when Matthew 24 uses the word then, it's referring to an event that happens immediately after the preceding event. How does verse 9 begin? After mentioning these disasters, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Let me read you as we close a statement that we find in a Great Controversy, page 589 and 590, where Ellen White removes the veil. She describes vividly what Satan's agenda is. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, Satan will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. That hasn't happened yet. Populous cities, ruined and desolate. Even now, he is at work. And notice she amplifies the list of natural disasters, uh, so-called, in Matthew 24. Even now, he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, those are fires, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in, every, in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. And now notice, there is climate change. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. And now notice the very next phrase. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing those evils. Does the world need to know this? Does the world need to know that there's a history transpiring behind history? I believe so. Folks, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the last hope of the world. I know that Jesus is the last hope. But as an instrument of the Lord, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the Lord's last stand. And Satan hates the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's the reason why he's trying to divide the church and to distract the church from its mission. While the world simply looks at horizontal history, and many will be lost because they don't have any idea what these issues are, in the great controversy, what are we doing? Let me just read in closing this statement. What, sh what we should be doing. Five Testimonies 452. God has, re has revealed what is to take place in the last days. For what purpose? that his people may be prepared to stand against the tempest of opposition and wrath. Those who have been warned of the events before them are not to sit in calm expectation 
it can't, no, she doesn't say it can't be, are, are not to sit in calm expectation of the coming storm, comforting themselves that the Lord will shelter his faithful ones in the day of trouble. We are to be as men waiting for their Lord, not in idle expectancy, but in Enos earnest work with unwavering faith. It is no time now to allow our minds to be engrossed with things of minor importance. While men are sleeping, Satan is actively arranging matters so that the Lord's people may not have mercy or justice. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness, that is, in the invisible world. The leaders of this movement are concealing the true issue and many who unite, listen carefully now, many who unite in the movement do not themselves see with, whither the undercurrent is trending. Do we, tell, do, do we need to tell them where it's trending? Do we need to proclaim the Sabbath more fully? Yes, people need to know the history behind history. She continues, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. And many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is trending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. It is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protest against measures to restrict liberty of conscience. We should search the scriptures and be able to give the reason for our faith, says the prophet, the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but the wise shall understand. May we, brothers and sisters, dear friends, be among those who are wise. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy. I ask that you will remove the veil so that we can see what's really going on. We know that Satan wants to win the whole world to his side. He also wants to win all the churches. He wants to win every individual in the world. I ask, Lord, that you will help us to make a total, complete consecration to your cause, to Jesus, and that we might, in many different ways, proclaim what the real issues are, because we want to see many, many in the kingdom when the end comes. We thank you, Father, for having been with us and for answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.